I'm Austin. And I'm Scooter. And you're listening to the Audio Drama Production Podcast. Part of the Audio Drama Network. So I remember the conversation that I had maybe a year ago at the Here Now Festival out in St. Louis with Stephen J. Cohen. And we ended up talking about a lot of stuff that made me change the direction that I did with Anansi Storytime and Legend Smith Productions, uh, where I formed a company. I started doing contracts with the people that are involved. Really, it's just a bunch of smart stuff to be doing as a CYA for you and your group in case there's any kind of internal conflict, in case there's an accident or, I mean, there's all sorts of situations that it's really just smart. And so we decided to reach out and talk to him because I had this fantastic memory of it. And yeah. So why don't we just play for you that fun and incredibly painful if you're not doing certain parts of this <laughs> conversation that we had. So what we wanted to get together to talk to you about was the general process of contracts and I guess other business concerns that you might have run into that you could help other people with. Oh, sure. Um, it'll, it'll be helpful to me if I more understand um, the shape of things that you are dealing with, because I, I would make assumptions that might be audiobook shaped and those might or might not be appropriate. So if you can describe the situation that you're, you know, some things and, and I can bounce back some ideas. Sure. Uh, one of the more common things we run into is like with, um, with an audio drama, you're going to most often have a cast of actors on or even writers. So specifically how you can structure that in such a way that the contracts with the individuals will retain rights for the you know the the project itself not necessarily got it so what you may so one thing that i found very helpful and i don't even remember who suggested this to me at first was to study how a film production company creates its organizational shape before it starts to do a film in that case, the film production company might be its own LLC, its own limited liability company, but then they'll tend to set up another structure. That structure lives for only the length of the film. Um, you know, so it might be bad robot into the darkness might be the into the darkness thing inside of bad robot as an example. And when they do that, they do that to, to like the LLC stands for, to limit liability. Um, they accidentally break something when they're on set. And, you know, they, the only assets that somebody can pursue are assets that are inside the, the, the right shell account. You're protecting people's personal assets. But the other thing that a company structure whether it is that formal or if it is simply um, p um, a much more informally pulled together partnership does, is if you were to say, create a partnership that technically is, is the rights holder for a production, then you can be defining, well, what means this person gets this percentage versus that percentage? As long as it's written out, they're an LLC or as a corporation, it's considered a partnership. And if there's um, six actors, a writer and an engineer involved, then that means the eight of you uh, are coming up with, with what percentages you are due from a partnership. Although technically, here's the weird part. This is why people, if money is involved, will go through the LLC corporation thing. Technically, each of you is 100% responsible. So even, you know, if you've got one actor who, you know, who's, who's got their one share, whatever you call that one share to be, um, and they've only done a small piece in the series, technically they are as responsible as somebody who has spent their entire time. That's the nature of a partnership, a partnership, all partners bear 100% responsibility. That's something to keep in mind. But the point is that if you were to, um, <clears throat> look up basic forms on forming a partnership online. Um, essentially, when any company has more than one owner, if there is no formal thing put in place, it's a partnership. If ADPP had set up a smaller, in quotes, company, you could call it a cooperative, you can call it a collective, whatever it is for a particular production. As long as you have that structured out, 
and list it out, then everyone's a partner. And yeah, the one thing that you're not getting from that is individual protection based upon percentage. But you are setting up a way that you're saying that all assets that come back would then be payable outward, if that makes sense. Now, if you're asking about the practical, like, like, is there a practical limit on my end when paying out a group of people? That's a whole different thing. And I just made an assumption as to what you were ask, asking about. No, it's fair. I mean, like part of it's liability. I mean, I don't know from my perspective how feasible it is to spin off a separate company for each individual project within our production company. Right, exactly. So the least you'd want to do is to set up. So let's say someone accidentally uses something without copyright, without with without uh, permission. You know, right. something that was perceived to be copyright free wasn't. Right, right. A, a misreading right. of 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 even a, a Creative Commons license could say that yeah, you can share and share alike as long as you're not selling it commercially. And then that part got missed and you wound up including that in something that was for sale. And so suddenly you have liability. If you want to protect people's home assets, you then you you've got a shell created, which then says only the assets that belong to the one production company are it. So they can't come after you personally. They can only come after your business. Well, right. They can't, they can't go after your car, your home, anything outside that. It's only the assets that exist within the company that, uh, you know, th- and that's the whole point of LLCs. And since I think you guys are in a number of states, you'll want to check to see which state has the easiest way to set up an LLC. Like as an example, I'm in Massachusetts And it's actually more expensive than if I were over the border in upstate New York to maintain an LLC here than it is there. Oh, wow. So it's it's really cheap. In New York, there's essentially a one-time fee with a a tiny thing that you do once a year to renew it. With me, I technically have to do that same first-year fee every year in Massachusetts. And in California, the structure is completely different. But I know that each state is a little different. So you'd want to check out check out um, which state has um, the most friendly LLC laws um, because it it could be the difference of hundreds of dollars to you know something that's essentially a token payment. It's good to know. So outside of the business aspect of things, um, what recommendations do you normally go for for having? I don't know if contracts is the right word or a waiver. Contracts is the right word because essentially, so the interesting thing is this, you know, I I know I'm older than both of you, but um, the thing that they used to say on the people's court, which I know that they said later on things like Judge Judy as well, is actually correct. But, you know, it doesn't have to be an official contract contract for it to be binding. Okay. So... Um, a simple thing to do is to use any of the online systems that allow you to draw up a contract. So whether that's Doc Hub or the really the really swanky one that's built into um, the Adobe Suite, if you've got the the annual fee on the Adobe Suite, where um, what's you know where you're sending out links and then people sign the contract, you then have a paper trail and a, and a series of dates. And all of that. So if somebody later says, I never agreed to that, you've actually got, well, yes, you did. You signed this PDF on this date. Here's the proof you did that. So, um, you know, those are actually legally binding. Uh, technically, just a handshake is legally binding. Of course, though, you're stuck in a he said, she said at that point. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, if you were to use any of the of the tools that are out there, um, I don't know if, if you're... Um, do you all use, are you in like the Google Docs universe of things? Yes. Yeah. So one thing that I did when I set this up, because you can still do this. So back in the day when Google first set up um, Google Apps for your domain, they had a version of it that was free for home users. And then eventually they stopped doing that. But you can still do what I did, which was I realized I wanted to lean on Google Docs because I'm here, I'm working with somebody in New York, somebody in LA, in Chicago, a few people in Europe, all over the place. Right. And I thought, all right, this would be easier if we use a cloud-based solution for what we do. Um, I actually went over to uh, eBay and bought 
one of those old accounts and then they just transferred it over to, to my account. It cost me like 60 bucks. So it's a one-time fee and I'm not paying a monthly fee to have like the entire Google Docs thing inside Spoken Realms. You know, so it's wow. all, you know, yeah, Google runs Spoken Realms email that way, but the whole thing is there. The calendar is there and, and all the basic versions of the um, of the business tools are there. Yeah, if, if I was spending five dollars a month per user, I'd have more resources. But I'm waiting until we sort of hit the the, the wall of this, and so it wound up being a one time fee to let Google manage that whole deal. But if you do that, you can add on. I think it's called Doc Hub, okay, which is a which connects to Google Apps. And in there, you would be able to set up a contract as a PDF um, and then have people sign off on the contract. Nice. Um, it, it is worth your while to, you know, to find a lawyer to help come up with just one generic contract. And then anybody who is reasonably sophisticated would be able to do basic modifications from that first one. Okay. Um, in, in, in my case, um, it was some, there was a lawyer who, who had done some pro bono work for a friend and I contacted him and he looked through them all and, and changed some wording and then explained to me why my, why my wording would have been, um, legally problematic. And I, I took copious notes on that and I paid him for like three hours of his time. And since then we've been using those basic contract shapes. Basically, he said that unless it ch- unless stuff changed very much, we would have no need to come back to do any other tweaking. And I thought that was really useful mm. as opposed to feeling like, okay, another contract, another lawyer. Right. See, I never thought about it. So we, one of the people involved with um, Legend Smith and the Nazi Storytime is a lawyer. So we've been like talking back and forth about contract stuff with him. But I never thought about a good way to manage that online. So if you know of any other resources other than DocHub, I'd love to hear about them. Yeah, the the one that's built into Adobe is the one that Tantor tends to use with its audiobook narrators. So every time I get a new book, so I'm starting another book tomorrow, uh, when I accept the book, within a day of me accepting, I get a link to, um, I forget what they call it in, in the Adobe world, but I get a link to log in. And there's the contract, and I scroll down, and I click where it says I need to sign. It then has me type out my name, and then I check a box, and then I get a copy of it in the mail. Both of those are are, are, are good, inexpensive solutions. I mean, I have no idea if anyone in your group is already using, as an example, um, Adobe Audition for any of the work you do. Hmm. You know, so if I, I'm pretty sure it's an add-on to that monthly subscription that there's a level of that subscription which includes that service. So, you know, if, if someone's using Audition or if you're using Audition and let's say Photoshop or Illustrator in order to create some of your graphics, then you may already have that tool as part of the Adobe suite. That's very interesting. Yeah, I think it's called Adobe Document Cloud. Document Cloud DocuSign. Something like that, yeah. Something like that. But yeah, that's what, that, that is what Tantor uses. Yeah, I'd never heard of any of these things. That's so this is all super useful. Well, so at what point do you consider retaining a lawyer uh, to some degree or another? A valid uh, something that people should pursue for their shows. For their shows, um so it it depends upon what you're doing. When I moved my uh, studio out of my house, it changed a lot of things because when you when you rent an office, you suddenly need to have liability insurance that you didn't need to have when you were in your home. Right. Um, But when you do that and you talk to them, they point out that, well, actually, if you didn't have it when you were in your home and something happened, depending upon how your your home insurance is, you may not have been covered because many um, homeowner policies exclude home offices. Oh, wow. Yeah. So like she scared me something something awful when she was pointing that out. And we did go back and check and realize that, yeah. Um, th- th- our homeowner's policy didn't have that. We would have had to have had like a separate home office rider. So technically, if somebody had come to record in the studio and they had gotten hurt there, if it came out that that was because of a business, the homeowner's policy could have refused to uh, pay out. Yep. You're going to have me looking hmm. at my homeowner's policy, my insurance policy <laughs> really quickly then. 
Yeah, that was just scary when she pointed that out. And it turned out that that was the case. It just had never happened. Um, but th- there's so little that we that we're facing liability for, you know, um, the kinds of things we face liability for are, are what I brought up before. Or if, um, you know, because it, it comes down to fair use and it comes down to payment, it could also come down to defamation, depending upon your content. You know, wow. if somebody takes your content the wrong way, you know, it could come to that, but it's not very likely. Still, I mean, like, then it comes down to a cost analysis of risk versus the cost that it takes you to avoid that risk. Right. And um, I wound up, because of the low cost of covering stuff, I wound up using Hiscox, H-I-S-C-O-X. Um, you compare them, like, call your, your homeowner people. They may or may not actually do business insurance. Um, and if they do, they may also simply be um, subcontracting from, a, from another company that does. It turns out that Hiscox um, actually specializes in doing that. So that way, it's a good, it's a good way to get a competitive quote. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna have to look into that. That's more than terrifying. I know the last thing you want, right? You know, somebody shows up, they slip, they fall. Somebody shows up, you know, they eat gluten and they're not supposed to. Yes, especially slipping and falling because that can really happen anywhere. Oh, it can. It absolutely can. Yeah, the little stupid things you don't realize, and and then as you move forward and you start to do things more officially, you realize, oh, we wouldn't have been protected. Oh, okay. You know, then you just realize you were lucky. You know, so is it worth? So you were you were asking about is it worth retaining a lawyer? And yeah, the the, the feedback that I got was uh, a lot of the lawyer structures, a lot of the structures that need to be put in place can be done almost in a template format because we're not hitting new things again and again. You know, I needed one contract that I could essentially modify by changing who it was and what the name of the project was. And that was pretty much it, aside from that the contract was the same. So the fact that the contract wasn't being heavily dynamic meant that it didn't really need a lawyer every time. We just needed a template. So for a volunteer projects, especially, because I had some confusion about this with some of my lawyer friends, do you, in your experience, feel like you would need a separate contract for every episode? Or could you do one contract for the entire show? You can do one contract for the show because when I just did, um, so I'm in a few episodes of, um, of, um, oh, what, what is it? Castle Rock. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, in the first season, you'll see me, uh, in, you'll see me easily in two episodes when they're moving the, the coffin. I'm the guy driving the car, moving the coffin. The oh, truck. wow. I'm driving the truck. So when the coffin gets exhumed at the end of one episode and then, you know, next episode it comes into town when it's raining, uh-huh. th- that that's me in the truck. So, um, and so there's one contract for that. Um, I didn't have to sign the contract again. It's written, you know, with that in mind uh, because it's dealing with the amount of hours on the project. It's not, dealing with um multiple appearances right it's not dealing with episodes and so the point is i could be called back another day in order to to do a few more hours and it doesn't matter what episode it's a part of right you know i've already signed off everything for that particular production okay and they brought me to two different sites as well so it wasn't even site specific it was for the production let me ask you this let's let's say for off chance because you're you're an extra what if they needed you to play a different background character with that then which is what they did a new you contract? Know, no which is what they did and and i'm compensated per hour okay um i'm compensated per hour the things that affected my uh pay were were weather so the ep- so w- when when it's raining it really was raining and so i wound up getting rain pay because that's part of the contract Oh, wow. Because if you have to keep standing out in the rain to do the same thing 20 times, right? you're standing out in the rain to do the same thing 20 yeah. times. And so, yeah, so that, that was written in there. Okay. So that's contracts. That's – I definitely want to talk to you about contracts. So I, I would go per series if I were yeah. you. And that way, if you wanted to change something from season one to season two, 
you know, like if you realized, you know, after you finished up doing one season of a show, it would have worked a lot better had we done X and Y or that time that we didn't shoot it, that time we didn't record in order, that time that we we arranged stuff so that although we were recording out of we were recording out of order in order to get all the lines from these characters done. That mm-hmm. yeah, that made more work for us at the end, but it made working with the actors more pleasant. Let's work that formally into season two. That way you get some flexibility, but you've committed to something for long enough that you don't have to worry about it. All right. So we've covered contracts. We've covered preventing general or covering general liability for you with like an LLC. Those are the two main things that I wanted to talk to you about. Hmm. Because I mean, honestly, like I remember when I talked to you at the Here Now Festival. Here Now, yeah. Yeah, that caused me to get my butt in order. To, I basically Good. left there and within a couple of months had the LLC set up and everything else. Nice. But, so how are you guys planning on monetizing once once you're once you're you know you've got the whole thing together? <laughs> All right. So for my individual oh. project, um right now we're just primarily doing it through Patreon. Um I'd like mm-hmm. to set up a merch site eventually. And one of the things that Austin was talking about for one of his other projects was kind of occasionally contracting himself out and his company out to do support production for other people's stuff. That was mm-hmm. work. I mean, that sounds like a decent way of monetizing as well. But so um, what you, especially with what Austin's talking about, what you may want to check into is you may want to. So did you listen to startup when, when it was a, when it was a big deal of a podcast? No, not really. All right. So the first season or so of startup is them actually starting what turned into Gimlet Media. After they oh, wow. finish that story and it really is kind of all pulled together, they then go on to talk about other startups. But initially, it it is them trying to build Gimlet, um, which of course is really interesting. And because you know, if you think of Gimlet and Radiotopia as sort of like the two gold standards of what it is, you know, of, of how do you monetize a podcast? Um, what Gimlet has moved towards is kind of interesting is for a while they were doing that. They were doing exactly what you're talking about. And what they were offering to do was they were offering to help companies tell their story through podcasts. Okay. Because they proved that they had podcasting expertise. And so some company wants to do that and, You know, and they were saying, well, we're, you know, you tell us your story, we'll help get it done. Um, That's one division of Gimlet at this point. Another division of Gimlet is doing something kind of interesting where um, producing a podcast is much cheaper than producing a movie or a television show. Right, right. Um, and right now Hollywood is utterly awash in treatments that people are never, ever going to read. So what they came up with an idea uh, was finding a treatment they liked, producing it as a podcast, using the download numbers to help convince somebody that this particular story has legs. So essentially, they're buying the movie rights to treatments, producing them as podcasts, and then trying to use the podcast downloads and listens as the proof that this is a movie worth making. So what's the treatment? That makes sense. So a treatment is um, I've got enough of the movie described that um, that that you have a a sense of what the project is. And so when you shop uh, a movie idea, you have one of two things. The old school thing is a treatment is, you know, it's it's written out. It's got a a certain kind of a a format to it. The thing that's happened recently because people just weren't reading treatments is they were almost like producing something akin to the coming soon, which, you know, which, uh, which is a hell of a lot of money because it's got to be filmed. It's still cheaper to tell the story, you know, to tell a similar story as a podcast fully produced than it is to produce like a two minute reel. Right. If it's video. So, so the idea that they had was, well, let's look around for, for movie properties and, and television show properties that we think have legs and that we think would work in audio. And then they're buying the rights. Now realize they can afford to buy the rights because they have like, what is it? Six hit podcasts? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Something like that. So they're leveraging that money to buy rights and then using the 
podcast listens and downloads as proof, in quotes, that this has legs to become a movie. But th- like I was saying before, their, their other thing was um, podcasting services for businesses, which sounds kind of int- uh, close to what you were talking about th- that Austin was looking at doing. Well, and I, I like hmm. that idea a lot, especially since in local advertisements for the D.C., New York, uh, Boston area, like for any of mm-hmm. these major markets, I feel like I see a lot of people that are looking for – companies that are looking for podcast managers and companies that are looking right. for support in making a company-based podcast. And, yeah, and that that looked like what they were what they were trying to fill. I'm not sure how much effort they're putting into each of those areas at this point. Uh, I know that one of those movie projects is a, is is um, a mini series podcast they did. You know, something with a beginning and an end called uh, Sandra, which um, is an interesting look at virtual digital assistants, and you can totally hear them you you can you you can get the sense of of this is either something on tv or or as a film when you're listening to it you can get the sense of what it is they're trying to do there hmm. yeah i'm wondering for that kind of thing that seems like it'd be something that would be easier to do if you had more of a film background well because realize so many of the people so many of the people who've seemed to come up with a formula come out of public radio so they all have that similar shape to what it is they're doing you know, it's very easy to get confused between a Gimlet property and a Radiotopia property because of that. You know, it's like what Roman Mars came out of PRX, I think, because I know he's West Coast, but I, I think I think it was PRX. Okay. Um, he may have been in Chicago at the time. I'm not sure, but um, I know that the whole Radiotopia piece grew out of the one thing that they were doing. And now, technically, what Radiotopia is, is it is um, Radiotopia owns their studio. And each podcast is essentially a member of a co-op. And all the members of the co-op have access to the studio. So that's the relationship between 99% Invisible and It's Alive and ZigZag and all the other things they do, is that they're all members of the co-op and Radiotopia owns the co-op. Own, you know, own, owns the property. Right. Interesting. Yeah, it's a really different setup. Yeah, I have not it's heard of that of model as model. far as like monetization kind of stuff goes. Yeah, it's it, it's different. So, you know, if you ever listen to their content, they monetize in very much the same way that NPR and PBS monetize with, with underwriting. Um, you know, they were among the people to figure out the whole thing in for recent podcasting where it works better if you you know yes it works better if you have the talent do the underwriting spot um but you need something that indicates that you've left show content and that you're now in a commercial so usually they have specific music that they will use behind you know the transition in and right. out of the commercial spots. So that's actually, you know, so that's something I wanted to talk to you about now that I think about it. Um, mm-hmm. I've been talking to a couple of other show owners about doing commercial trades between episodes. Mm-hmm. Like where they run a, in either an in character or a done by the narrator spot for story time or legend Smith. And then we run one for them as well. Um, I'm trying to figure out the best way to transition into that especially if I have somebody like the storyteller or even one of the characters do it, that's not confusing. This is supposed to be part of the episode, but this is supposed to be something that a call to action to you and not just part of the story. Right. So yeah, Radiotopia's model for doing that really is kind of good. Imagine you have this piece of music that you tend to use. Now this depends upon you having written your episode so that you feel like if this were on television, this would have just gone to a commercial break. Right. Right. So you have the kind of scene that ends where if it were on TV, we would now ex- be expecting, you know, Fritos or right. Dodge trucks or something to show up. So, you know, we've we've ended. There's a point of tension, but the scene definitely had that closure to it. Right. And then this piece of music happens. This is the same piece of music that happens all you know, every time. It's a bumper. It's not very long. And then after the bumper starts, you've got 
the talent doing the commercial. The bumper might end, but then the bumper will come back before you transition and now back to our show. And if you use the same bumper inside your show each time, you've created the, yes, this is us talking, but we've created walls between the content and and the advertisement. Right. So how do you feel about it, mid-rolls versus pre-rolls versus post-rolls for that kind of stuff? Mid-rolls work if, if your content is written for a mid-roll. Um, the pre-roll and post-roll thing um, is easier to do because it's always easier to be able to tag something in, in the beginning of the show. Mid-rolls should cost more um, because a mid-roll, theoretically, if I'm in the middle of the content and I'm taking a break, and remember, it could be fictional content, but it could also just easily be between two stories on This American Life. Right. Right. You know, because they, they're doing multiple stories on one theme. Same idea. You know, so you, you, you've you come to a conclusion and we're going to, you know, come uh, coming up next. And you'll even think about this if you think about this American life. You know, they're talking about aardvarks. So, you know, they have this story coming up next. When someone confuses a stuffed aardvark for a real one, we'll get to mm-hmm. that story right after this. And then right. you go into the mid roll. Right. So you can do it in either fiction or nonfiction. It should cost more because theoretically you have the investment of the um, of the listener at that point. In fact, yeah, up to three, I would think a post roll would be the least expensive because a post roll, a pre roll, somebody is going to sit through. Only a very impatient person is going to um, try to fast forward and figure out when the pre roll ends. Right. Post roll, somebody might say, "Well, the story's over anyway. Why do I want to listen to the ad?" Whoop. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm glad. That was just a set of keys. It sounded really oh. loud. <laughs> it did, yeah. but it was just a set of keys that decided the edge of the table was not a good place anymore. Yeah, it almost sounded like you fell out of your chair. I did not fall out of my chair. That's good. <laughs> I, that, which is why I thought to say I was okay. <laughs> but yeah, so um, there's also a company called Midroll, which will help facilitate um, you getting midrolls from other companies. You'd have to have a good sense of who your listenership is, though, because it's mm-hmm. the same idea. It's trying to get you to match your content with an advertiser. So I've always been kind of on the fence when it comes to commercials on my programs. Right. Just because like, I don't, I don't feel like we're at a volume of viewership where monetizing through commercials makes sense. Like the amount of money that we would get back out of it would not necessarily be worth the hit that it takes to our content. Does that make sense? Now that's the, the perception is it would take a hit to your content. Huh? So you feel like that's not necessarily the case? Well, it would depend upon I would say if it's going to if it's going to be hit on your content, it's the wrong advertiser. Um and so why would I say that? Well, let's jump back to the Radiotopia example. Um at least it seems if you listen to the underwriting on 99% invisible, um the staff at least has tried if not our current actual users of whatever the product is. And so like, as an example, if you were going to do a commercial for Zencaster because it's been so useful to you Mm -hmm. during this, I don't think that would be perceived as taking a hit to your content. Whereas, you know, something that really didn't have relationship to your content would. See, I feel like that makes more sense for something like the program that we're working on right now, the audio drama production podcast. Um, Probably when it comes to like an actual audio drama, though, those kinds of commercials can feel like they're out of place. Well, if it's those kinds of commercials, so let's let's go back to a Nazi story time. Right. So, what happens if the Children's Museum in Philadelphia has an exhibit that's both local and online, and you shared the fact that you do this, and they wanted to advertise on the show? Would that be out of place? No, it wouldn't be out of place. That, hmm. You're right. That's no. There's there's plenty of products and advertisers that make perfect sense. I am trying to get a feeling for how it would change the flow for how it currently works. And I really think that the best model for that for for like here's the end of my content. 
but I'm doing something and now I'm going to come back to the content. Uh, the, the best model I've found, the one that feels the least jarring is the Radiotopia model on that. And it's slightly different for each show because each show has different underwriters. Um, Gimlet Sandra is the same way. You know, the stuff from Gimlet Media follows a very similar format. And I think a lot of what they're doing comes out of the fact that it's technically not advertising in public radio because there's no call to action. So that's, that's what the difference is between an ad and an underwriter. An ad says, go buy this today. Uh, an underwriter says that the underwriter was funding this show and they're telling you about the product, but there's nothing in it that says, go buy this right now. Hmm. Um, and yes, I know that from writing software for uh, public radio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's that's the weird thing. And it's, it's, it, and it's a difference and it does make a difference. I mean, it's why they could, you could have Exxon Mobil Masterpiece Theater and it yeah. didn't necessarily feel like it was the wrong thing because those spots were written in a way that kind of said that Exxon Mobil thought Masterpiece Theater was important. Nice. Right. You know, so it, it wasn't the same thing as as saying, you know, buy this car. Um, they all basically reversed it. Right. But but still got out the message of the corporation. Right. And so I, I have a feeling that the reason why the ones that feel most comfortable come out of public radio is public radios had to walk this line of you and I both know the three of us all know that as far as under, you know, there really is no difference between an under underwriting and an advertisement. They're all right. ads. The point is right. the reason why they're there is they want you to buy the product. Right. You know, Herman Miller air on chairs. You hear that all the time on NPR. <laughs> mm-hmm. And believe me, you know, yes, they're comfortable chairs and they probably are in quite a few, you know, schmancy offices, but you know, they're, they're not, they're not there to support the content. They're there to, to, to be in your mind because they think the people who listen to those shows are more likely to want their product and then their office chair is uncomfortable. And so they replace it with this expensive chair, you know, so it's an ad. It is an ad no matter what you do. But I think that the, the people who came out of public media really needed to deal with this and grapple with this earlier on because the federal government wasn't taking care of all of their their financial needs. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they needed to start taking underwriting dollars, but how did they do that without intruding on the show? And definitely a a mid roll is the most intrusive. So, I mean, I would only look at a mid roll if you were in the middle of a drama, if the drama had a cut the black scene where, you know, where you might actually improve the tension by having that commercial break where everybody goes, no, I want to know what happens. Right. You know, Otherwise, I'd avoid a mid-roll like like just about all public television does. I mean, you know, it, it is the most expensive, and it's that for a reason. Underwriting. I like the concept of this. It's I really, yeah. when I was looking into this before, I was looking at more of a traditional commercial. So how is that normally funded? Because, like, the, the advantage of a commercial is with the call to action, oftentimes people will give out, like, a code. And then the, the company itself yeah. will use that as proof on how well your thing is selling. Absolutely. And, and those codes, that is what, what like uh, 99% Invisible will do all the time. And that's one of the shows from Radiotopia, right. where, um, where what they'll do is they'll be talking about a product. I think one of, uh, I think Squarespace is one of, one of their uh, sponsors. And so Roman will talk about the fact that his personal website is a Squarespace website and what he likes about it. So I feel like the reason why they accepted Squarespace was because they had experience with it. At least that's what the perception is. So, and his personality is a big part of the show. So getting his endorsement is of high value. So he talks about his personal site on there. And then at the end, he said, he gives a Squarespace URL that ends in slash nine, nine, which of course is them doing the 99% invisible thing. So how do underwriters um, have any idea of how, how much your show it's is more affecting. right. It's, it's the same thing. You know, that that's what I'm saying is these things have gotten cl- so close together. They, no matter what they do, they are all advertisers. The, and yes, the lack of a call to action is what technically in, in, if you watch 
public television, you'll see that there isn't something like that. You know, it'll say this was under, you know, this was underwritten by so and so, the 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 this and that company. Yeah, but it won't ever say um, buy yours today by going to so and so dot com slash NPR. But you've started to hear those things when they feel like they can get away with it, right? Hmm. You know, and so it's a question of writing the content of the commercial in a way that makes it not feel like a commercial. So do you think, so from what it sounds like you're saying, this can be done as simply as this episode was brought to you by um, Ford Tacos to anything as complicated as when you're talking about like an air on chair, like, or a product that you use. Right. I, I would say that the, the, so your personality is what sells the podcast, even in, even in dramatic podcast. Now I'm not saying use product placement. You totally could use product placement. I mean, you know, the seasons where Seinfeld made fun of the fact that they were doing product placement were among the funniest I remember. You know, the whole thing with the juicy fruit and and the uh, and the the junior mints and all that was because those people played paid for product placement. You know, that's why those things wound up being featured in in a show about nothing. Hmm. Um. You know, so I'm not saying use product placement in the middle of a dramatic thing. Say, hey, yes, give me that Coke. You know, it it's not the same thing as, you know, um, the episode you're about to hear is brought to you by blah, 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 blah the maker of Who's Wuddy since 1994. Check them out online at blah, 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 slash ADPP. Not that bad, especially if the blah, blah, blah has something to do either with the people producing it or the content of the show. So what is the best way? It's funny. We started with like one realm of things and we've, but this is really good yeah. content. So I'm not going to complain. It's just how do people approach companies for this kind of, to make this kind of arrangement? So this is some of the stuff that you and I were talking about originally at the here and now festival. Right. Um, if you can build if you can build a profile of your typical listener and at first what people will tend to do is they'll use themselves to stand in for the typical listener. But of course that's not what I'm talking about. If you build in enough calls, calls to action in your show that you get at least a little bit of play on social media, and then you follow back to people's profiles and say, Oh, more often than not, the people who are responding are women in their early thirties um, from what we can tell, they're in cities mostly on the East Coast. Then, okay, we've got something there, right? So we didn't necessarily think that was our audience, but that's who they turn out to be. And what I'm talking about are the early adopters, the people who are easy to get to do something for you. So then in a future show, once you realize you've got these sorts of things and just staying on things like a Nancy story time, um, you know, so this, you know, this week's story was based, was using this, this myth from this culture. Do you have stories like that in your family? If so, share them online. Don't forget to tag us. And then you see who actually does that, right? And then you track back to their profiles and figure out what you can about them. There's an NPR show called um, The Takeaway that does that beautifully, because they talk with people about all these other things, but you'll notice they almost always do exactly what I've just described at the end of a conversation. Don't let the conversation end when this show ends. Reach out to us on Twitter. Here's our handle. Please be sure to use hashtag this. And then they would start to see who was responding. And that was, yes, that was in part to really keep the conversation going. But it also let them do some forensics on social media to then build a generic audience profile. And it's not a profile of the entire audience. It's a profile of the audience that I can put it in the negative way that is susceptible to a call to action. That's the negative way to look at it. The positive way to look at it is these are the early adopters. These are the people who are more likely to reach out and tell their friends that they found this podcast than somebody else. And you start to build a profile of who that person is. And the more detailed that becomes, the more you can think about that when you're putting content out, because those people will be more likely to, you know, to be again, 
avid early adopters who are likely to spread the word. That was actually one of the reasons that I was recommending to people, even if your show is very new, that you should set up a Patreon. Because yeah. it gives you a solid idea, even if people are coming out of the $1 level, of the people that like your show well enough to uh, put effort into it. Right. You know, not everybody is, you know, it's like in, in our own ways, we're all doing that same thing that Amanda Palmer is doing, right? You know, she, she gets out there on social media. She says, I'm starting to work on this new project. You know, people who are supporting me will get to see it early. I'd like your feedback. And then every once in a while, she'll open up, she'll open up something of that to the world to get some feedback for. But what people are getting in response for the fact that they are being a patron is um, is they're getting early access to the creative process. It makes mm. them feel better because they're on the inside. They're getting to see something before other people do. Because we all know that the new iPhone is exactly the same on the on release day as it will be two weeks later. The difference being to get one on release day, you have to give up the entire day and sit in line. Whereas two right. weeks later, you can walk into the store and just buy one and leave. Phone's the same, but there's a person who has to have it first. Mm -hmm. Those are the people that we're looking for within your larger audience. The person who has to have it first is usually also the person who will tell somebody else going, I just listened to this podcast and you just really need to do that. This is so totally you. They, it's, it's a similar demographic. A couple of um, people who talk about things like this, I mean, there's the one of my favorite things to ask people to take a look at is the Amanda Palmer um, TED Talk. That's such a um, good TED Talk. I love it so much. It is. There's another good TED Talk by a guy named Simon Sinek. He's done a couple of them. Um, and um, S-I-N-E-K. He, the, the one that, that, that got me to start listening to his material was Start With Why, where people don't care what you do, but they care about why you do it. When, when you're at some sort of a, an event, if somebody says, what do you do? Unless you have a really interesting occupation, it's like, oh, oh, okay. They've put you in a box now. They've defined you. That's never as interesting as to say to somebody, why are you a dentist? What made you become a dentist? Right. Right? You know, that opens up a whole other personal story. It's a whole other thing. Um, and he, he goes through like um, – like I, I, the three of us on this phone call are all technically adept. And so this is a fair example. There are times where physically an Apple computer on the inside and a Dell computer on the inside are essentially identical. Mm -hmm. Enough so that with very little work, you can sometimes get a Dell to run Mac OS. So oh, wow. essentially they, they, they are nearly identically and in, in nearly identical internally. But if you look at Dell advertising, Dell advertising is we make computers. Apple's advertising is um, we think technology should assist creativity and never, never get in the way, you know, and they walk through all these other things and, and about what they do and they happen to make computers. And so Apple's messaging is about facilitating creativity and very rarely do they talk about computers. They even took the, the word computers out of their out of their name. The reason why there are people who are fervent fans of Apple is they understand or agree with that mission. Um, and Simon Sinek has uh, has a couple of things where he, he talks along those lines. And really, just that early adopter person is the profile that you're looking for in a startup. That's the customer segment that you're trying to find. People will talk about that it's somehow amazing that they have like an 8% market penetration, 12% market penetration. When really, if you look at the percentage of early adopters for a new product in a space, typically it's higher than that. So it's easy to stumble over that those kinds of numbers. The hard part is to make it beyond the early adopters into the general population, Early, you know, the people got the very first generation flat screen TVs weren't doing it. I mean, those first generation ones were horrible by comparison to the things that were much cheaper even a year later. But those are the people who had to be first. You know, those are the people who in the crowd, because we all have at least one person in our peer group who's that person who tries things before other people do. 
Definitely. And yeah. that is who you're looking for within your larger community of people, because those are the people who you can get to be your evangelists, getting other people to come and, and listen to your material. So there's a certain amount of messaging that once you have a sense of who they are, you want to try to send their way. You're trying to enable them. You're trying to give them more information because they will do the work that you can't because you and we're, we're one person. We're two people. We're three people. That's it. You know, whereas, um, you know, if you've got a hundred listeners, you can mobilize that way in a hundred different cities, then your numbers will start to grow. I like that as a model. That's a good way of looking at it. I think, man. Okay. That's a lot to process. Um, (laughs) that's a lot. Well, thank you for giving me a lot of homework assignments. I didn't have enough to do as it was. (laughs) <laughs> so it's also it's also funny because um since we had our talk i went back and i made profiles for um from what i can tell from people that were interacting with us and just mm-hmm. from people that i'd met in person that had said how they like our show that you know not friends of mine necessarily but right you know occasionally i'm at events where people will be like uh either we'll have a table at an event or somebody will just for some reason recognize me and then talk about how much they like our stuff so I have like written out profiles based on these kinds of things as well. The problem is that it's hard to get like proof proof. Like this is still all like information that I've personally gathered. I don't have like hard numbers to apply to it. Right. So if we take the numbers that you've gathered and, and then we combine that with a Twitter campaign and that Twitter campaign includes using a specific hashtag in order to share some comment that is content that is somehow connected to your show. You've then enabled somebody who's not you. So you can do this as a real white room experiment because you might bias it. You have somebody else go back and look through all those profiles and build profiles. You compare those to the ones that you've built. Now, as long as the person building the profiles from the social media campaign is not you, then you haven't biased the result. And if you wind up with similar profiles to the ones that you've done and the ones from the Twitter campaign, then you know you've got valid profiles. Hmm. Well, when you're approaching an advertiser, don't they want to have more body behind that? Well, realize that what you'll have. So again, you, you'll admit you'll. So what you'll do is this: you you know what your download numbers are. You have you have a good idea of your listens, right. and you can say from what we can tell, because anyone who doesn't admit this is still a lot of. Uh, it, the term that uh, the people at the Media Lab at WNYC will use for this is de-anonymization. Okay. And de-anonymization is incredibly difficult. So you are totally allowed to say from what we can tell. And then later, if they're still interested, you can sit down and explain, well, you know, we built these profiles. We then compared them here. That's how we have that. You know, those kind of jive with our download numbers, which say these are the downloads in D.C. and in Philadelphia. This all seems to come together because de-anonymization is really difficult. And de-anonymization, just not to scare anybody, isn't about figuring out who an individual is. It's about figuring out that my typical listener is a 35-year-old video gamer and not a 26 year old um um avocado toast i don't know i'm going off on on some tangent that'll get me in trouble <laughs> but but you know what i'm saying what i'm saying is it's not about de-anonymizing isn't about finding a person it's about figuring out a group yeah you're looking for trends but you want it to be like right. specific information trends not just people. right right and so anyone who um anyone who will do a call to action on twitter and include a hashtag so you can do that work is in a way allowing you to then go back and say well what what can i what can i glean from their profile oh they like this television show oh They're connected to these people. Oh, I can tell by location things that they're in the Midwest. You know, you start to pull that information together. I don't need to know their name, address, and 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 social security number. That isn't really what I'm going for. What I'm going for is I'm trying to to, I'm trying to get audience demographics, and de-anonymization is really the only way we can do that. Yeah, I've done a bit of that because I mean, one of the nice things about for one Patreon and two Facebook is that for your page for that, 
the through ads that you run on the page and through some of the insights that they give you, you can see some of the general trending information for your site. Right. Um, it's not right. quite accurate because as I'm finding like a lot more people actually listen to our show than follow them on social media. When I thought about it, that makes sense because people don't need social media necessarily to keep track of something like there was with like a BuzzFeed article. Um, because once they subscribe on their app on their phone, they don't have to think about it again until the app tells them there's a new episode and they pay attention to it. Exactly. Exactly. And there's, there's other ways to get, to get those people interested and get those people to do something. Um, you know, uh, Radiotopia goes as far as emulating the NPR. It's, it's fundraising time again. Although they're not going for a financial goal in the current one that they're doing, they've got a, a, a number of a, a, just a total number of, and they, so they don't care if it's a one dollar donation or fifty or whatever. And they said, and if we get to this number, everybody gets a sticker, and they're going to mail out stickers to everybody. And that, so we're not talking big. I mean, and we're talking Radiotopia here. Yeah. You know, they're one of the big guys, and they're giving away stickers. But only, but only if they reach this absurdly large number of donations. Well, maybe it'd be a really, really cool sticker. That's the reason why. <laughs> Holographic. I think he would. Yeah, he may have been saying it was like a thing of stickers, maybe plural. But still, they're giving out That's stickers. True. We're not talking coffee mugs. Yeah, or tote bags, like NPR does. Exactly. You know, but but he but they're but they're paying attention to the shape of that because they know that they brought a large part of their audience from public radio. So that group of people is used to supporting their content in that shape. That makes sense. All right. I think I'm pretty good. How about how are you feeling, Austin? My head's full. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, I love it. Uh, well, thank you for talking to us, Stephen. Well, um, hopefully, we'll get a chance to talk to you about something else soon. I loved having you on. Okay. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you so Good much. Good talking to you, too. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. So, yeah, I wanted to thank Stephen J. Cohen for coming out and talking to us. You can find him at SpokenRealms.com. He's, his company does a lot of great audio work, if you're looking for that, especially in the audio book realm. It was a great interview. He was absolutely full of knowledge, and uh, I hope we get to talk, talk to him again soon. I do, too. I, I look forward to it. I always like talking to Stephen. He's a great person. This episode was brought to you with the support of our patrons through Patreon. For more information about how to become a patron, go to patreon.com slash ADPP. Where you can get some interesting perks as thanks for your support. Don't forget to check us out at audiodramaproduction.com. Thanks to our line producer and editor, Tanya Milojevic. And our executive producer, Matthew Boudreaux. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening.